Good afternoon and uh, welcome to all of you who have joined us on this very interesting um, YouTube live session. Um, we are living in very interesting times and I am again privileged to have with me my dear friend and, uh, and, and I think one of the most astute debt fund managers that we have in the industry right now, Shiram. Uh, Shiram basically is the chief investment officer um, for debt products on the fixed income side for um, HSBC Asset Management Company. It comes with more than two decades of experience, uh, both in international markets um, and currently manages uh, about 40 or 1,000 crores of assets, which is very, very large. Um, Chiram, I, uh, good afternoon and, and thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, Jaiwal, and a very uh, good afternoon to all uh, who have uh, taken the trouble to log in. Hope this session is uh, uh, useful for all of you. I'm um, uh, middle of the day, and I think I'm starting with a with a um, note that I read in the newspaper today. And the headline says, "Time to move away from equity and focus on debt." Um, and we know that India is an equity market. We all are equity investors. I'm sure you two are an equity investor. Explain this statement to us. What does this really mean? Uh, see, I, I think uh, focusing first on the fixed income uh, or the debt markets, as we call it. Uh, uh, I, th I think 
we have come a long way over the last one and a half years, right? I mean, uh, rates at their lowest uh, policy rates were at 3.35%. I think a lot of us um, were sick of seeing those, you know, 4% portfolio yields or uh, even in uh, FD rates, et cetera, 4, 4.5%. Four and and, and uh, what has happened over uh, the last uh, year or so is very, very rapid and sharp upward moves in interest rates. Now, um, uh, there are two parts to it. While that upward move does mean, uh, let's say, when interest rates go up, prices of fixed income securities comes down. So if you look back on portfolios or performance and all of that, yes, there, there is a, a negative impact because of that upward move in interest rates. So that is, let's say, the part that is backward looking. But if you really reset yourself to where we are today and you look forward, and, and which is what I want to emphasize and what you highlighted in terms of the article really talks about. Um, need to uh, wake up to the fact that interest rates across the board over here in India are, let's say, close to 7.5% uh, as far as, let's say, a lot of fixed income or debt securities that trade in the market. And this is uh, across the board, whether you take a three-month security or a 15-year corporate bond, everything gives you close to pretty much 7.5%. Uh, same thing with FD rates, same thing with all fiction asset classes in general, that it has had a huge reset. Um, so one um, urge to all the uh, people who have learned today is that we need to reset ourselves to the present times. And looking forward, if you see um, interest rates or you know, a lot of funds, if you talk about debt funds, uh, most of them, let's say, have yields upward of 7.5%, even those with, let's a purely government security uh, kind of um, uh, underlying holdings. And if you take into account the index be indexation benefit that this budget that has just gone by continues to uh, provide us benefit of, which means three year uh, plus uh, it gives you long-term capital gains tax indexation. Indexation levels are pretty attractive because inflation is high. So all of that put together, I think post-tax, post-expense returns on a lot of debt products are indeed very attractive and which is the whole genesis of that uh, I think meant that fixed income uh, is definitely our outlook are over the next two to three years. Fixed income is going to be a going to do very well versus other asset classes. I won't get specifically equi the equity versus debt. Uh, that, that's an area that my colleagues will more venture into. But talking just about my area, fixed income, I, I think it's it, it's going to do well compared to most other asset classes. Uh, 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 given the kind of like I said, post tax uh, uh, returns that one is likely to see over the next few years. Thanks, Shilam, for that that forward-looking positive view, saying that um, this year, the coming year, are going to be um, years of fixed income in a manner. Uh, now, we obviously have seen a rapid rise of interest rates and inflation-led interest rates rise across markets globally, and 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 we obviously follow the U.S. markets, so obviously we have we've also increased our rates. Now, is is that period now getting over, or do you see that uh, we will have a few more rate hikes happening in the India? economy um, or or even in the US economy because I think I think that is what will follow and we obviously had a had 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 some, some uh, Mr. Powell coming up with a with a couple comments around this so what's your sense I mean do you see that rates are going to be uh, hardening from here on as well sure uh, um, so let's uh, look at it in two parts let's take the start of the mm -hmm. global context uh, uh, I, th I think in our uh, annual outlook we had uh, uh, somewhere I had mentioned that uh, and at that time, of course, one didn't know um, what's really going to happen to the course of the year, but it, that it is going to be a year of changing narratives. I think that was our main thing, even in terms of our thought process, in terms of portfolio management and how we modulate our portfolios. Be careful. The narratives will keep changing through the course of this year. And that's something that you have to keep reminding ourselves. If you just look at, let's say, the first two, three weeks of January of this calendar year, the beginning of this calendar year, uh, U.S. markets, uh, bond markets were doing extremely well. Huge rally, almost a 50, 60 basis points rally where, you know, the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield uh, came down from 3.9% you know, to as low as, I think, 340 or a little bit below that. And there was this, all these expectations build up that Fed is going to cut massively in the second half of this, of this year, even though the Fed was actually in their own dot plots indicating something very different, which was that higher for longer. Our expectation, at least at that time, was that indeed there is going to be a catch up between the two and more likely that the bond markets will catch up with where the Fed was. And what has really transpired since, let's say, middle of January till now is that gap has completely closed out. Fed stays where they are. In fact, now they are indicating 
like you mentioned, Paul is indicating, they might have to go a little bit further than what they had indicated earlier as well in terms of rate hikes. But the big difference has been bond markets coming out of their, uh, let's say, uh, notions that Fed is going to buckle down, they'll come in to rescue the economy, especially when egg markets are doing so well and in general the economy is doing fairly well if you look at unemployment wage growth and all of that it it, it uh, really uh, uh, i think set themselves up in terms of the sell offs that we have seen which has been very so now yes treasuries are, are pretty close to 4% uh, levels um uh, so so the caution over here is right now there's a lot of obviously negative talk going on uh, the pendulum has swung the other side now markets are obviously extrapolating okay how much higher can the fed go do they need to go to 575 do they need to go to 6% what will happen to emerging markets and <clears throat> sorry india as well if if that would have somewhere over here i mean not knowing obviously what is uh, that we are also data dependent that we have to be very humble in this period and say okay we will keep tuning in our forecast and projections on the data but i would still come back to the starting of the year thing it's a year of changing narratives hold your horses uh, don't extrapolate too much when the pendulum swings the other side my sense is and and this is uh, somewhat premature but i do think uh, over the next 2 3 months uh, uh, or the next couple of quarters we will see the us data uh, start showing the slowdown uh, and once that get start reflected in under data i think this extra nervousness of you no know, never ending rate hikes will uh, calm down as well and our sense is uh, us markets are now fairly priced which means we we don't see that as a huge negative influence on our indian bond markets uh, from the current levels it is taking our heads out neck out obviously uh, uh, things are still evolving so those disclaimers very much are there it is uh, uh, a very uncertain world but i do think our takeaway is uh, things have repriced a fair bit now to be patient wait for the data to show that slow down and and by the way if it doesn't the the other corollary to that is that uh, you need to see a massive risk off and a ma- massive equity market sell off as well because if the fed really keeps going towards 6% and the economy is doing not too badly in terms of recessionary trends it it means somewhere equity markets really need to reprice earnings projections and various other things so uh, either way i think fixed income as an a safe haven probably benefits uh, even that scenario so that's what, what uh, i think the risk reward has turned in favor of fixed income from a global perspective i think quick few points on our indian context as far as is concerned um uh, as a market observer and as a participant in the market um uh, my take is that i think the rbi has done a way way more better job of communicating this whole shift and transition in policy to the market player to the people at large and they have been super consistent and i think hats off to them for the way they have really dealt through you can actually contrast uh, what's happening in the us wherein in the previous uh, fed policy probably they should have been a lot more hawkish they should have set the context there instead they chose not to for whatever reason markets rallied now they are doing the exact opposite when markets have already soft and yields have moved so much higher they are adding more fuel to the fire by saying no oh, we need to go even more higher i think that just creates unnecessary volatility uh it's a tougher job of course as the world's largest economy but over here in india uh, clearly the rbi i think has been exceptional in the way they have held their line yes there are a couple of uh, policy members external members uh, in the committee who have dissented but i think by and large by a majority i think four out of the six have been fairly consistent that let's not let our guard down there's too much happening globally and over here too we need to see inflation come down sustainably which means that our tightening stance continues and i think that that message has meant a lot less volatility for us over here yes interest rates are moved up but the volatility has been a lot less uh, surprise element has been a lot less and i think in general we are well equipped to deal with the fallout of any global panic reactions or volatility that come and i think that's where i would draw a parallel with let's say or or the the opposite with how things were in 2013 14 i think the vulnerabilities that the indian economy had at that time uh, just made us um, a sitting duck in terms of getting punished by global volatility i think compared to then we are probably on the other extreme wherein our economy is fairly sound in terms of purely from a macro perspective and i think that gives us a lot of uh, strength to be able to deal with these ups and downs and we are seeing that getting reflected in the rupee as well right uh, uh, i mean even though dollar has strengthened a bit us yields have moved higher we are we are fairly okay we are, we are uh, 
our growth and various other uh, parameters um, are fairly strong for an emerging market uh, economy. So, so I think overall, uh, I would say, uh, final point would be to own to Sweden by we are in that data dependent zone. Noises and uh, uh, talking mouths will add to the uh, fuel to the fire invariably. And, uh, and suddenly when the view goes wrong, they certainly disappear. But I think through all of that, I would say at our end, um, we, are, we are not that uh, pessimistic. We think our economy is fairly well positioned. Yes, interest rates will go up a little bit more higher, but we don't think by a whole lot more compared to what we have really gone through over the last year or so. That's very comprehensive, Shilam, and you, you covered a lot of ground there. But broadly, what you're saying is that um, interest rates have already rallied lead significantly. There could be a little more headspace to cover, but that may not be very, very large. Of course, uncertainty stays. I mean, we cannot, of course, uh, predict for that. But but that remains. To um, either way, this 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 current rate is a good time for investors to invest into into fixed income. And the third one, of course, you're saying is that from a policy decision making um, and sharpness, the Indian policymaker appears to be far more clearer in what it wants vis-a-vis. Uh, -vis let us happening in the US. Great. I, I think I could see very two very interesting questions, uh, Shiram. Uh, one of which, and the first of which is, is something that we I think I'm sure we'll revisit again during the call. This says, going by your views, uh, should we consider active funds rather than passive funds? Um, so that, that's, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, let's say, I, I think I'm very, very glad, first of all, at least as a discussion point now, it is coming up uh, a lot. Uh, most of our conversations with investors, advisors, distributors, all of that, and with corporates is indeed on this point. And I'll, I'll just explain a little bit over here. See, there are pros and cons to both. There is, uh, it's just that I think the reason why this debate comes up a little, little bit now is because the last two years has been so one way towards allocations only towards funds and passive funds. Uh, active funds have been virtually zero or I've seen uh, lead, uh, significant redemptions. It's got very lopsided. I, and I think that's where um, I would take a, a few points to just set the record straight in terms of what are we really getting in terms of pluses on the passive funds or index on side, and what are you also losing when you compare it to something like an active fund. Um, and, and, and overall, I think uh, over the last year, two years, without a doubt, it has been absolutely the right strategy. And a lot of investors have got it and advisors and uh, uh, such as yourself have got it absolutely right. Index funds, passive funds was the way to go uh, because they gave a certain amount of predictability, certainty. Yes, interest rates have gone up in those segments as well. Uh, so the returns maybe uh, don't look that great. But over a period of time, you know what you're going to get in terms of uh, 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 given the point at which you are invested in those index funds. And which is reflective of the interest rate scenario at that time. Whether you are put in an FD at that time or an index fund, you'll more or less get, uh, let's say, the, what was prevailing at that time uh, overall uh, if you stay invested till the end. Uh, but I think um, now if you come to the current context, what are we really dealing with in terms of a macro scenario? Like I said, we, from a low of, let's say, 3.35%, which was a reverse repo rate uh, uh, about a year back, uh, we are now at a repo rate of 6.5%, um, uh, which is the RBI's policy rate. Markets are pretty much assuming the next rate hike to 6.75. And also the one after that, I think, is also now uh, pretty much priced in by the markets, which means we are assuming uh, rates going towards 7%. Um, and let's assume that that more or less turns out to be accurate. Um, it still means that we are pretty much at the peak of interest rates. Um, uh, we, uh, and, and if you really see, usually whenever interest rates peak, uh, markets in terms of interest uh, rates on various securities tend to peak a little bit before that. And markets start discounting or start trying to guess when the pivot will happen. Now, pivot meaning when will the uh, central bank, first of all, move to a neutral and then, of course, from a neutral to a rate cut. It is not that actual time of rate cut. Maybe let's assume a rate cut actually happens in middle of next year or end of next year, 2024 calendar year, if you talk about. But markets don't wait till then to start pivoting. They'll start pivoting uh, usually six months, sometimes a year before, like we have seen in the US, three rate cut surprise. And in all of that, it means that there is a very, very active element of interest rate moves that are going to happen, which can be very meaningfully taken advantage of. We view that as an opportunity because the big upward moves in interest rates are dealt with. Now we are talking at worst what will happen, interest rate <clears throat> consolidate. 
but at best what can happen like we have seen usually whenever rates are at their peak something goes wrong somewhere and suddenly there's a complete reversal of mood uh, everything and suddenly fixed income becomes a go to asset class and what we feel is that don't wait till that point to plan out your investment strategy it's a 3 year investment horizon right from taxation perspective mm. so let be well ahead of that time a passive fund in all of these things what it will do it will roll down exactly the way if you had bought a 3 year fund let's say last year it would be a 2 year balanced mature fund today in a year's time when actually let's say the rally is happening it would be a 1 year product and like we all know lower the duration lower the benefit of capital gains in terms of interest rates moving lower when that happens because your multiplier on basically if a 1% move lower in interest rates happens Less and up. if your duration is one you get 1 into 1% which is a 1% <coughs> capital gains if the same duration multiplier is let's say increased to 3 or 4 then the straight away your capital gains becomes 3 or 4 times 3% or 4% in terms of capital gains and which is where investors should at least try and uh, understand that part of it that hey an active fund can actually move from a duration of maybe one or two years right now to four years or five years and that that gives a multiplier the second very important point why an active fund uh, um, starts making sense is so far eyes closed government securities have been the best asset class to own because your corporate bonds which is basically all your triple a rated bonds and maybe even lower rated bonds the extra yield that they give over a government security is virtually nothing it does, it's not there's no reward uh, compared to if you look at historical uh, trends at all so it doesn't make sense to get into either corporate bonds or even sdls to a large extent etc right now if you really see which means government securities are the best in a passive fund let's say uh, and and of course uh, um, uh, you you get locked into that same class for the next 3 or 4 years of the balance then that investment same thing in an active fund what happens is a fund manager right now might to be let's say 100 or 50% in central government securities but if in 6 months time or in a years time and which we believe is likely to be the case your corporate bond levels go and offer let's say half a percent or 1% more than what a central government security gives which is what is the norm usually uh and if that happens at least an active fund manager can move from government securities into corporate bonds and make that asset allocation shift without you losing your taxation benefit you still are in the same fund you are still uh, indexed in the same way at your point of entry but the underlying composition of the portfolio has suddenly changed from let's say a uh, predominantly uh, government security portfolio to maybe a predominantly triple a psu kind of portfolio bond portfolio and that can add good amount of alpha in our view uh, to returns over the next 3 years so so those are the pluses and minuses an index fund gives you predictability it gives you a single underlying asset class or whatever the asset class for the start of that inst- of that of that index fund um and those are great plus points but scenario and which made a lot of sense in the last two years but come reset yourself the current scenario what does it call for but now in the next three years i think you need a little bit of active duration management and you need a little bit of active asset allocation in the sense of just moving within fixed income from central government securities to triple a corporate bonds or to else when spreads widen and that flexibility i think can potentially add a meaningful kicker to yields which are already attractive first of all you know in the base case so mm. that's the pros and cons if you are over allocated to index funds i would suggest your time to keep some space for active funds they've gone out of flavor yes but usually these things come back to the bank uh and and of course if you don't have any allocations and you're fairly risk covers you want to make sure that you just want predictability an index fund is surely a very attractive uh product and in fact uh, we have one coming up uh, which is going on right now the nfo so, yeah. so yeah. obviously uh, the intent of this conversation is not to diesel any of it it's just to point out the pluses minuses take a measured call both the products are very good the debate has been so one sided so far or the flow so one sided i just want to open up that and say hey look at the regular actively managed funds as well so both active and passive must have some space in your portfolio each of them have a different purpose to meet they are not for the same reason uh, and and the outcome can be very different than 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 each other so that that so we get that and i think you mentioned about the fund that you are that that the nfo of the fund that's going going on at this point in time um we would possibly want want you to take back a bit and look at the very basic so we we've, we've been talking about target maturity in the recent past quite a bit in the marketplace and we were talking about target maturity help us understand what what is a target maturity fund 
a target maturity fund um, uh, uh, the nature of an index fund so basically what we do is we we first the uh, i mean when we let's say as a fund house when we decide to go about uh, putting in place a target maturity fund uh, our first point is okay which index to use for example if i take let's say i'll draw parallels with our existing new fund offering that is there um, so for example in that we have the crisel gilt june 2027 index so that's an index that has been constructed by a third party which is crisel based on parameter liquidity uh, various other parameters outstanding how much volume is there in that security etc and they have put to let's say three or four bonds of central government so we have chosen let's say a pure central government um, uh, underlying portfolio 100% uh, and which is where crisel has a 100% central government ownership all securities have to mature similar to an fmp that we all remember so well uh, fmps uh, you can't have a single security with even one day maturity beyond that of that uh, index uh, uh, fund maturity date so there's a so in our case for example 30th june 2027 is the maturity date uh, even the index will have only securities which are just below that close to that but just below that in terms of maturity and when we are and uh, let's say the funds get mobilized etc what we will do is we will pretty much replicate to a to a very very large extent the, the portfolio as given by the crisel index so uh, which means if they have let's say three securities in the government security uh, 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 segment and that's the entire portfolio our portfolio will pretty much be willingly the same uh, and over the entire period till 2027 you'll see our fund mimicking exactly what is happening with the crisel index mm. Uh, it will be like an FMP, which means that today it's a four and a half year fund because it matures in June 27. Let's say 4.3 years. Um, in a year's time, it will be a 3.3 year balanced maturity fund. And if you really wait for another three years, it'll be a one year, close to a one year product. And at maturity, it like an FMP, the entire uh, all the underlying portfolio will mature. You will get back the money in your hands because the index fund has matured. Um, returns are very very closely linked to the yields at the point of investment. um uh, again over there the crisel index forms a very good uh, you know uh, 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 tool to compare with because we are as a fund house we are bound in terms of the tracking error uh, that we can versus the index and we need to really be very very close to the index which means the nav returns will be very close to that of the crisel sometimes a little bit higher sometimes a little bit lower but it will be very very marginal and and that gives a lot of comfort to the underlying investors in terms of predictability certainty uh, and all of that so i think that's basically really a target maturity so if you look at the plus points um, uh, the tenor is known up front so you plan your asset allocation very well and you know what type of tenor you have really got into the for in interest rate risk is um, not there if you stay invested till the maturity of that index fund uh, so if you stay for the entire let's say four and a half years till june 2027 like i said your returns will be very very closely linked to the yield at fund uh, minus expenses and all of that uh, at the point at which you invested um, and thirdly the portfolio does not keep changing it it mimics the and it mirrors what is happening with the crisel gilt index which means it will continue to remain 100% government security till the life of that fund uh, even though the underlying securities might change a little bit here and there based on the uh, new issuances that keep happening uh, by the central government so i i think that those are the few key positive points about a target maturity uh, key characteristics and 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 the product that hsbc aims is getting uh, these are all government securities right the underlying are all, all government securities um we have we, so we had a choice this time for the 2027 uh, june product that we have right now going either to go ahead with a 100% central government security or do a 50 50 Uh, which is fairly typical in the market uh, in terms of various fund houses 50% in central government securities 50% in state development loans or sdls as we mm. all know it mm. uh, uh now sdls usually trade at a a, a spread or at or a higher yield compared to the underlying central government securities because they are state government uh, securities so they need to give a little bit more reward for the risk mm. that one takes over there usually this tends to be closer to half a percent say 50 Base points, or even more. Sometimes it goes up to one percent. Over the last, I think, three to six months, we have really seen the extra pickup that a state development loan gives uh, come down to like, like a virtually nothing. Uh, it gives you hardly fifteen or twenty basis points. 
Uh, and at that kind of a difference, you're better off actually buying only a 100% government security uh, because there's why take risk if you're not rewarded? Simple. Uh, you don't know what will change, but you're better off in a central government security. And which is why we have chosen a 100% government security uh, index fund for this particular launch in 2027. Super. So we are coming almost to the hour and to the end of this session. I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll end this by, um, say actually, this is the second last question I'll ask. Um, so one of the one of the uh, key objectives of all investors is is beating inflation, um, uh, you know, and um, obviously on the equity side the approach towards that is slightly different. Uh, but in a in a in a rising income scenario, the general assumption is your your inflation is also going up broadly in the same measure. Um, so how does this fund, for example, or how do fixed income investment by themselves uh, beat inflation uh, for an investor? Sure. Um, no, I, I think uh, over there is where, we, you know, if you rewind back to the very beginning where you know, we were talking about what has been happening over the last, uh, let's say, three weeks, four weeks, we have seen a huge reset in terms of market expectations of both the Fed, interest rates moving higher globally, and over here also. And just to highlight that, uh, that we have seen interest rates move up almost by half a percent, which means 0.5 to 0.6 percent higher across various segments as just in the last three to four weeks what that means is for example the segment that we are looking at the june 2027 segment uh, a simple central government security which is let's say sovereign so basically no credit risk element over there uh, and and probably the, the safest asset class in terms of from an issuer perspective that itself gives you an annualized yield anywhere between 7.55 percent to 7.6 percent as of today this will keep changing, obviously, on a day-to-day -day basis. But this same interest rate was probably closer to a 7.2% maybe a month mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. So we have mm -hmm. come up almost 35, 40 basis points higher. Now at a 7.5 to 7.6% in range, if you assume mm -hmm. an annualized yield, um, and, and then work out the math in terms of take off the expenses, take off the indexation and the, and the tax uh, that one pays, um, our calculations show that returns are well above 7%. Uh, after accounting for everything. And, and I think that's, um, which means a post-tax, post-expense return about 7% um, for a three, four and a half year product. Now, and that is where coming to your question, if we really see how inflation, uh, you no, know, on a steady trend basis, because right now, of course, inflationary uh, scare just coming out of that, slowly inflation is coming closer, at least to 6%. But if you really see RBI's projections for, let's say, a year forward inflation, etc., typically it's that 5.5, 5.5% kind of an inflation zone. So if you take a band, I think 5 to 6% is a reasonable band of inflation in our country, given that we are a growing economy. Yes, RBI's target is 4%, but let's assume for the sake of conservatism that we don't hit 4% and we remain 5 to 6%. Even over there, if you look at what the product that I spoke about, or a lot of fiction products out there, you're, you're getting almost a percent, percent and a half more after taxation, after expense, compared to let's say a steady state inflation line, which which is which is I think reasonably attractive. Uh, can that become more attractive? Yes, in two ways. One is of course if interest rates move higher, which we don't think is likely to be the case mm -hmm. in terms of very meaningfully. But the second is that inflation indeed undershoots a little bit, and that is. Uh, uh, something that we'll see over the next two, three, four years, if indeed RBI is successful in getting inflation down to 4%, they are trying their uh, best to try and do that. Uh, but that's where you know, beating inflation has an upside because inflation could trend a little bit lower than our somewhat pessimistic assumption of 5 to 6% uh, that we are talking about. So I think overall uh, attractiveness of fixed income, I mean, uh, just to highlight another product, a simple product like a one-year uh, bank's certificate of deposit, right? Uh, I mean, issued by all your private or triple A public sector banks, that gives you now close to 7.8%, 7.85%. I mean, um, uh, again, compared to inflation and all that, these rates are not bad at all. And this is all happening because liquidity has tightened a little bit in our economy. Uh, uh, banks, credit trends are stronger than deposit trends. And all of that means that it gives us as investors opportunities. And I think that these are, which is where Let's say, for example, in our no, money market fund, we are, for example, we are doing a road uh, strategy of that one-year uh, certificate of deposit strategy. To us, that makes a lot of sense. Yields of 780, 85, 
just give predictability to underlying investors roll that product down to maturity and it it's a it, it gives fairly attractive returns compared to a lot of other uh, uh, areas similarly an index fund that we spoke about that at annualized yield of 755 760 right now uh, fairly attractive compared to uh, where uh, inflation is trending etc so i think these are opportunities which is why yes there will be a lot of uh, uh, noise now we are in that time zone uh, globally and over here through all of that i think the one message that i want to try and give to investors is um, as far as fixed income is concerned we have seen a lot of pain already over the last year uh, it is now time for us over the next 2 to 3 years to enjoy the fruits of that and uh, according to us these are good times uh, from a fixed income investors perspective i think the waiting game is over uh, time to allocate money time to get into products in a measured way there is no nothing that is running away but there are few products out there that um, deserve your attention deserve consideration and i think those in our view should do fairly well from the next uh, uh, few years perspective um super i, I think you have sort of given your last word if i could say in terms of the fact that um, this is this is as much an effective vehicle against the threat of inflation and again in here also you need to look at a bit long term look at um, look at your own considerations before really decide to invest uh, and like you said things are not running away right it is not that one has to hurry to do it tomorrow morning but there's an opportunity and we must sort of plan out for it um if if i were to ask you one last answer um who should invest in the target maturity fund that is that is currently on from your side um i think let me tell you who i think need not invest um <laughs> uh, uh i i i think uh, uh, an investor who is uh, uh, already very very heavily allocated into index funds because that's been the big trend a lot of money has gone into that so somebody who has i could just throwing up numbers 60 70 80% portfolio into of their fixed income portfolio let's say into index funds is it that there should be one more index fund in your portfolio very frankly the answer is no i have a lot already I enjoy the benefits of that uh, uh, like i said over there say keep some money for active funds at least some pro proportion uh, take your pick okay. low risk mid okay. risk higher risk that, so that's one set of investor i would say um, um, if you already have so much coming out of yours on index fund is there a need to have one more no but apart from that any other investor let's say somebody who has very little allocation in index funds somebody who's let's say somewhat conservative and wants predictability certainty as far as fixed income uh, uh, portfolio of their you know uh, allocation of their portfolio is concerned um i i think uh, this product is very well timed we are fortunate in of having this new fund at this time when yields have already moved up so much and we are able to tell you that hey this is what has happened and uh, really it's a good time i mean rather than have the reverse wherein you launch a fund and then you see interest rates go up so i think somewhere uh, 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 we are i think to our mind it's a good entry point uh, it makes sense for an investor to consider now importantly march gives you one more indexation right that's a point that we did not touch upon uh, the fund is structured <clears> in such a way june 27 maturity there are five indexations that are possible for an investor coming in in march and staying um, uh, till 2027 which is a huge benefit now let's say you want to wait for a month or two months i think some basic math suggests that that itself takes off almost 30 35 basis points uh, of your cagr returns over a period because you lose out on one indexation um so uh, given all these things interest rates have already moved higher fairly attractive you get one more indexation you are not over invested into index funds and you would rather keep things simple and uh, uncomplicated in your fixed income part of your portfolio i think all of these kind of investors should probably be uh, really uh, looking at these uh, this kind of a fund super super sure i think very very insightful conversation and i think um uh, the the fact that virtually all investor needs can actually be managed by a uh, by a considerate in investment into 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 debt funds especially at this point in time is very evident uh, thank you thank you really appreciate your time today uh, and all the very best for your for your uh, new fund thank offer uh, to the audience i think please please look at uh, what we have to offer from hsbc amc um, do look at look us up at our websites for more details on the product Uh, for hsbc customers who look at uh, reach out to your rms and we'll be able to help you uh, look through the investment options available and keep uh, listening to us logging into us 
depth and talking to us um, every time we get across to you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Shiram. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks, Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much.